So when we're in the third week now of our little surprise Advent series that I didn't expect when I was writing it, but happened anyways. Two weeks ago, I talked about how when God does something new, it's usually not what we expect. It's usually something better, but it's not what we expect. I used the example of Jesus, who the people expected to save them from Rome, but instead saved them from sin and death. Then last week, I talked about how even if we don't know specifically what it is that God is doing, we know it has to do with restoring shalom, bringing the world back to the way it's supposed to be. And we looked at the prophecies of Isaiah about the return from exile, when the people would come back from Babylon back to their home. And today we're looking at what happens when they came home. What happened in the aftermath of God's new thing is the exiles come back to Judea and start to rebuild what they had lost. The account from Ezra starts with a proclamation from King Cyrus of Persia, who had at this point recently conquered the Medes, who had recently conquered Babylon. Because, you know, everybody was conquering everybody at that point in history. It just kind of happens. And he sent out in the very first year of his reign what can only be described as an obviously manipulative decree. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. He has commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem in Judah. Judah, there, that's, the, that's the word I'm looking for, Judah. If there are any of you who are from his people, they may go up to Jerusalem in Judah and build the house of the Lord, and the, the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. This is a very smart and very common PR move by a brand new king. It was the history here to, you know, when a king came to power, he would start out his reign by issuing reforms. Things that were not great under the old king and would be so much better under the new king. It's a way to build goodwill at the very beginning of your reign. And so Cyrus does that. He makes a lot of people very happy at really no cost to himself by saying, you can go back home and build a temple and oh yeah, your God told me to say this. It's so manipulative, but it worked. And Cyrus completely unwittingly actually fulfilled God's prophecy in doing this. He probably didn't have great motives. He was probably just trying to make himself look like a good and wonderful king But in doing so, he did exactly what God said would happen, that a guy named Cyrus would be the one to bring the people back from exile. And so he lets the Israelites return home. These people who were conquered by a previous empire got to go back to their house where they would be much less likely to rebel and have some level of autonomy, which also made them less likely to rebel. The more you think about it, the less altruistic this decision seems and the more you kind of think, ooh, Cyrus was a real smart guy. But like I said, it's also the fulfillment of a prophecy that God made. This is the restoration that God promised to his people. Cyrus just thinks he's trying to make himself look good, but he's actually fulfilling this promise. And so the people get to start going back home. And about the first thing they do after they build their own houses so that they have a roof over their heads is they start work on the temple. And it starts out with just an altar. And so they rebuild the altar of God in the same place that it had been 70 years before. And there was a good deal of rejoicing. This was the first step in God's promised restoration after the exile. A year of preparation later, the people laid the foundation of a new temple where the old temple had stood. But this time, the celebration was a little different. Most of the people were shouting joy and praise to God for the progress that has been made on God's house. But a few people had a different reaction. The older priests and Levites, the ones who had actually seen Solomon's temple, wept 
instead of rejoicing. Most of the people were shouting with joy, but there were a few that seemed like they're shouting with sorrow. Now, a lot have been written in Bible commentaries about why some of these people had been weeping, but, and the thing that makes sense to me is that they were both mourning what was lost and realizing that they were never going to get it back. This temple that they're building was never going to be as glorious as the temple that was destroyed, and it wasn't going to be as glorious as the temple that had been promised them through the prophet Ezekiel. It's a fair reaction. Solomon's temple was a masterpiece, and the second temple would never be that majestic. The first temple held the Ark of the Covenant, that box that was God's footstool, that contained the tablets of the Ten Commandments, Aaron's staff, some pieces of manna, contained things that had weight and meaning to the people of Israel. And this new temple would never hold those things. All the riches and relics of the first temple were gone, never to return. The new temple might have some of the same rooms and the same layout and the same basic things, but it wasn't the same. And for the people who had seen the original temple, laying the foundation just made that realization come home. And then, of course, there was the prophecy in Ezekiel about a new temple, a new temple that was even grander than the first one. And they could tell from the foundation that it wasn't going to be that temple either. And so they mourned that loss. While most of the people around them were rejoicing, their reaction was, it's never going to be how it was. Sometimes as I feel like as we live as Christians in this world, we often have the same reaction. The world around us is changing far quicker than it has ever changed before. And the church is having trouble adapting to a situation that it's never been in. And we often have the same reaction that those people witnessing the temple being rebuilt had. Just a great sadness. We're living in what can only be described as a post-Christian world. And we don't know what to do. The church has lived through a pre-Christian world. That's what we exploded into most of Europe in. We've got used to living in a Christian world where it was generally assumed that everybody went to church somewhere. And sure, they might go to a church down the street, but they're still going to a church somewhere. And the first two questions you used to ask when you meet somebody was, where do you work and where do you go to church? But now that's not really how it works. It can feel a little bit like we're in exile. And many of the systems that we've come up with on how we do church together just aren't as effective in a world where more and more people don't identify themselves as being Christian. It's a hard reality to face and we are right to mourn it. The world is different today even than it was 20 years ago when I was growing up in church. Things that worked when I was a student 20 years ago just don't work for high school kids now. But even if we're right to mourn that loss, it's not right for us to stay in that place of mourning. Like the people who returned from exile, there's still work to be done. They built a temple We're building a church. It's not the same as the old church, but it's still the church. God's people gathered together to do God's work in the world. So while we take that time to mourn what we've lost, to cry out in sadness that it will never again be the way it was, we're still called to get to work. There's still a foundation to be laid. 
Timbers to be timbered. Roofs to be roofed. There's still a church to be built. So as we leave this place today and go out into the world, we don't want to be people that just yearn for how it was. We want to be people who go out from here bringing God with us to a world who needs to know that God is more than just something out there who wants people to be happy and be nice to each other. But to let them know about a God whose sole business is all about restoring shalom, restoring the world to the way it's supposed to be. And by leaving this place and going out in the world, bringing God with us, we show that God by how we live. But of course, that also works the other way. If we leave this place and go, oh, I wish it was still how it was 50 years ago or 20 years ago, even 10 years ago, then what are we bringing out with us? And so I look at the people as they were rebuilding the temple. I look at their sadness, and it's good to acknowledge that. It's good to acknowledge the things that was lost. But there's still a church to be built. There's still God's work to do. So even as we acknowledge that things aren't going to be how they were, we can remember that as we move forward, God is still with us. God is still restoring shalom. He's still making something new. And he calls us to join him in his work.